Hello, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to have you all today at our webinar, our EdTech webinar. Um, as AWS, we're excited to partner with EdTech on the journey to making the experience great for students and educators. Um, we really see ourselves as a partner, not as a vendor, and are our customer obsessed. So essentially, if you succeed, we succeed. Um, today on the webinar, we're going to go through the programs we have in place. Um, and also, we will be joined by CDSM, who will share their story on how they got started on AWS. To wrap up the webinar, we will have Francisco Gonzalez from our SA team to go through our global infrastructure. You can ask questions throughout the webinar in the live chat, and we will try to answer as many as possible. So now we will have Juan Luis Vilches to go through the ESSER program we have in place. Okay, thank you, Senia. No yes, hello, my name is uh, Juan Luis Vilches. I work as an EdTech lead for EMEA at AWS. At AWS, we work with um, all types of EdTechs, big and small. Uh, today, we'll be talking about AWS EdStart, which is a program that we have designed specifically for um, EdTech startups to help them get to the next level uh, quicker and faster. So the agenda for today, for this uh, coming 10 minutes, we'll be talking about um, the program, what it is, just a little bit about the background of the program and why we, we thought it was a good idea to um, to launch it, what the tenets, the different tiers that we have and the benefits that uh, you can get from the different tiers. We would also just mention what the application criteria is for each each of the tiers and the process to, to apply. To end with, we will just mention some of our members here in EMEA and just a, a few um, testimonials from them. But before we start, uh, I'd like to share this slide because um, in many occasions when we talk to EdTech startups, uh, they do mention uh, some of these names, some of these big names that, ha that have already uh, built their platform and their business on, on AWS. I think it's a nice nice slide because it shows different types of EdTechs. So we see some of the most important uh, LMS platforms such as Instructure with Canvas, uh, Blackboard, Desire to Learn, D2L. We also have some of the uh, most important uh, <clears throat> A MOOC platform such as Coursera or or edX. Uh, I also like the fact that uh, we have some of the um, what we used to call uh, education publishers such as Macmillan, uh, Pearson, Santillana, Oxford University Press, uh, Cambridge University Press. Um, these companies are continuing to transform their offerings, personalizing their their content. Then we also have nice stories from companies such as uh, Duolingo or Matific that are using our um, some of our um, artificial intelligence services. So for example, Duolingo and Matific are using Amazon uh, Poly, our text-to-speech services, so to, to be able to, to um, use their content in, in, in tens of languages, actually. Uh, we also have a, a good example of Echo360 using Amazon Transcribe to, to do the transcription of uh, different lectures uh, and be able to share this with students that maybe have may have um, uh, disabled uh, capabilities or just uh, for um, uh, indexing purposes and search purposes. Uh, so that's that's important. Uh, we also have some good good examples of uh, companies such as uh, Firefly in the UK or Open Classrooms in in France, who used to who launched their business actually based on a software that uh, was built on 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 hardware and platforms that um, infrastructure that customers had to buy on their own and have moved their platform to a, a fully uh, SaaS offering, which is also good examples. So these are good examples of companies that have already succeeded in business, and this is the way to go for, for startups. So AWS at Start, as I said, it is a virtual acceleration program. The whole idea is to help edtech startups get to the next level and um, giving them benefits uh, in the technical side and also in business um, perspective too. The background of the program, just, just a little heads up. This program was just founded uh, just over two years ago in, in the US initially. It, ex it did expand globally uh, to the rest of the world uh, last year. Actually in EMEA, it was announced, I think it was in, in July last year, and we had the first applications coming in, in June. It is now currently available in 34 countries. And most of the European countries are, are there, 
We also have a few countries in the Middle East and South Africa and Africa, but you will see that there's more countries coming up uh, continuously. And probably most important, this, this program was really built uh, on uh, mainly customer feedback, some of the startups that we're working with, some of the education companies we're working with, and also on the <clears throat> ed tech market observations. So what we found is that you all know if you are running your startup that uh, having a startup and developing the startup in business is, is not easy. But if you're doing this in, in the education space, you will probably find just a little more obstacles and maybe it's just a little harder. So we did find this, this limited resources for edtechs, although we've seen that other edtech uh, sector specific or uh, sorry, um, startups uh, in other sectors do get more resources and more support. Uh, no, it's not so much the case for, for edtechs. It is a, valid, a very, a very challenging uh, uh, landscape. You're talking to uh, about uh, customers, uh, students, uh, and uh, yeah, you will probably find some additional uh, issues regarding uh, regulations and, and compliance and security. Uh, so that, that's, that's hard. Then we also see that um, users, decision makers, buyers, owners of the budget are normally very different people, different uh, uh, parties. So they makes it, this makes it a little, a little hard. So at, at it'll be as, as we're working with uh, startups, we work with edtechs, and also we're working with uh, those customers that edtechs are approaching. We thought we should be doing something uh, to support them. So the tenets of the program is really to be able to engage early and consistently with <clears throat> with uh, with edtech startups. Uh, we found that. Many of the um, startups in the market are uh, using AWS by default, uh, so as we have a, an important market share, but not, they did not always have the chance to talk to us and, and get, engage, get engaged with us, so we could, we could support them. We will be focusing on innovative teaching and learning technologies that can really create an impact on, on student outcomes and you know, education institutions. And we really want to make it uh, really easy uh, for edtechs to engage with us, but also to engage with other edtechs and other peers uh, globally. So this is what the tenets of the program. As I said, we have AWS SR as, as the program. We developed two different tiers. So first we have the innovators tier that is intended to help the early stage uh, edtech startups. And then once these innovators have advanced their business and also technology wise, then they might be in, a, in, a, in the right stage to apply for the second tier, which is called the uh, a member tier or AWS Head Start member. <clears throat> so you will see that one of the um, focuses of uh, engaging as a member is really to help you uh, get started with customers, with investors, with acceleration programs. So we do um, we do look at uh, at tech startups that are um, already in business that have an MVP in place. Are and you know are still uh, having uh, their first customers if they're not kind of uh, already uh, making making revenue. The benef different benefits that uh, members get will probably fall into these different uh, pillars. Probably the first one will be around the community or the ecosystem. Um, startups normally ask us to get in touch with uh, other techs, with investors, um, with uh, acceleration programs and also with potential customers that we may, we may be working with. And the whole idea of the community, uh, Peter, is to help them uh, do this, either through events such as pitch days, where we, where we have some of, some of our members talking about their business and solutions to a combination of investors, customers, and um, other, startup, other startups and other ethics, but all, and also in a more um, individualized uh, way or individual way where you approach us and say, okay, I want to be, get introduced to these people or to this country or to this other uh, market. So we're happy to do that. We do offer uh, technical assistance and, and training. We offer webinars uh, regularly and not just on AWS services and offerings, but also on some other topics that may be related to, to, uh, to that text and you know, your, your innovation. This is an example. The last ones we have done have been around um, Alexa for education. We have had, had a lot of feedback, a lot of questions around how we can um, leverage uh, voice interactions in your own platform. So we're happy to do that. Uh, we also, and um, um, what's an important benefit, we also provide a financial uh, benefit. So we do provide uh, AWS credits. The whole idea of providing AWS credits is that if you're a startup, then uh, we might 
we might want you to use that budget uh, on some, something else rather than paying for for AWS for some time. So uh, if you have a, a marketing campaign or you'd like to invest that in in developing a new feature or uh, you know sales uh, uh, kind of activities, uh, that, that's good. A second aspect of having AWS uh, and not paying for it is uh, it will give you a chance to uh, to to try and test some of those more advanced services that you might not might try. So I'm sure you will be using probably uh, our compute services and the storage services and database services, but we really want to encourage you uh, trying our our uh, artificial intelligence services, machine learning services. So because we do see that uh, this can help you get your product faster. Uh, uh, and, and quicker, more, probably more successful. We do um, also work on publicity benefits. So uh, we do and uh, develop blog posts, customer testimonials, video testimonials that we have on our webpage, white papers, and all sorts of social media and conference engagements. So the criteria to apply to the members uh, tier is quite simple. And we do want to see that uh, and you are a startup, so we, we we have defined and we drew a line at five years. So if you are within the five uh, five years and you were found in the last five years, you you can apply to the program. In terms of revenue, you we want companies um, that have not really succeeded uh, heavily in business, so below 10 million um, US dollars of of revenue. We want to make sure you have a, a solution that is applicable and that is addressing the education market in an innovative way. Uh, so that that is also very important, and we will see that of course you, your country is located in one of the approved regions. As I said, most of the countries in in EMEA are are in the list, but not all of them. So you should probably um, check that out. If you want to do this, you can probably just Google AWS Ed Start or just go to aws.amazon.com/slash/edstart. This will actually um, you can press on on application, look at the application criteria, and actually uh, apply from there too. We did see that um, during last year, we were getting a lot of applications that we could not accept, mainly from uh, early stage startups. Um, they were just starting a business or even just starting on, on AWS. We didn't, we didn't leave them behind and we, we thought it was probably good value for them to also get started with us and uh, be part of the, of the program, probably in, a, in a, a lower touch way. And we launched this new tier just last July called the Innovators tier, as I said. Uh, focusing on early stage um, uh, startups. Benefits, um, as I said, we're only starting, so benefits are probably not, not, as, not as, um, as comprehensive as uh, for the members tiers, but you do get $500 uh, um, dollars in promotional credits. This is normally uh, an important amount uh, when you're starting and you're testing the, our platform, so this is probably a good, a good way to start. You will get some technical assistance too, and you will be part of the community, so you can you can you can join us in in Ed Start meetups, and you know you will be getting our monthly newsletters and getting access to our portal. So these kind of things. Some of the members uh, we have right now in EMEA, we have around 70 members coming from uh, all regions. So of course, a lot of from from mainland Europe. We have a few from um, South Africa too, also uh, Israel. So I'm just showing up uh, some of the uh, names just in case you know some of these people. If you want to have access to the, the updated list, simply go to our website and you know there's a, a section on members. You will have the whole list uh, over there. Before we, we finish, uh, I'd like to share some customer testimonials from some of our uh, members. And you might know, so for example, we have Aula Education from, from England. They said that uh, this program had allowed them to explore other solutions that they could not uh, explore or afford before, which is good good feedback. Firefly, also a company from, from the UK, um, they're pretty established right, uh, right now. So they really saw the value in reaching out and connecting to the wider community and, and just uh, exchanging uh, ideas and you know, getting opportunities for, for partnership, partnerships and collaboration. We also have a third example from a um, smaller startup from Spain called Smiler Learn. And they were really happy that they had joined the program and because it allowed them to, to have access to international events and meet uh, foreign investors that they wouldn't have met if they hadn't joined the program. This was their feedback. 
I think that's it for me right now. Um, if you do have any questions, please feel free to just uh, drop them in your chat box, and we'll be talking, looking at, we'll be taking a look at them uh, later. And now we'll just uh, hand it over to Christopher Tromans. Christopher is the head of of uh, technology partners uh, for public sector and education, how we, we support EdTechs to the partner program. So thanks very much, Juan Luis, and hello, everybody. Thanks for your time today. Uh, as Juan Luis said, my name is Chris Tromans. I um, manage our technology partnering business for the public sector across Europe, Middle East, and Africa. Um, I'm just going to talk to you for 10 minutes today about uh, how we partner with companies. I'm going to look at, you know, uh, kind of try and define a little bit what we do, talk a little bit about the, some specific benefits that I think are useful for people on the call today and uh, leave you with some information on, on how you can find out more. Um, we kind of divide our partners into two types within AWS. Um, we have consulting partners who are companies that you know, typically will go to market primarily with a professional services offering and technology partners, which are those companies who tend to go to market primarily with a product of some variety. Historically, they would have been you know, classic ISVs. Today, uh, it's much more varied with many different forms of um, SaaS providers also included. Um, and today I'm going to talk more about technology partnering as I think it's the um, most relevant to the audience that we have here today, but I will show you where you can find out information about all types of partnering. Um, when it comes to technology partners, we really look at two very key core concepts, and that's one, the first one is helping you to spend less on AWS, and yes, you heard right, um, spend less, that uh, sounds counterintuitive, but it's um, it's really what we're very focused on, and then the yes, other side of that is... Let me interrupt you, are you sharing your screen, yeah. because uh, we can see a blank uh, screen, I'm not that's sure if you're sharing the screen. screen. Oh, that's very strange. It is. It's, uh, it tells me that it is sharing my screen. That's weird. Um, okay, now it's now it's good. That's good. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much, Juan Luis. So <clears throat> you had a sneak preview then of <laughs> of the slide. Um, we look at these two core concepts of spending less and helping you to sell more. Um, Spending less is something you'll probably hear about from a lot of people um, around AWS. Is it's something we do for all customers. But I wanted to just focus on exactly what we do with technology partners, and then I'll go into a bit more detail around how we help you to sell more. And um, we start off in the journey of selling less by looking at the technology that you're using. We look at your um, uh, architecture. We look at the products that you're using. We say, well, how could we make this more cost effective, more efficient, um, you know, less less burdensome, that sort of thing? Can we look at changing out? Um, to make sure you're using the optimal type of database or maybe the optimal storage class um, for the workloads that you have to really see if we can cut out any unnecessary expense anywhere. And you know, this got right up to real cloud native stuff like um, using serverless architectures, which really help you to, you know, to control and to 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 pay for, for the infrastructure in different ways. And once we have, once we're kind of um, confident that we've got your technical costs down as far as they can go and, and and you know remember this is bearing in mind the security and all of the other important things the security and performance and all of the other important things that you're going to want from your architecture when we have it down to the price point that we think you know is, is, is as low as it can get then we look at how you consume aws and how you uh, would prefer to pay for that and we look then if if there are ways that we can use different mechanisms we have to help reduce the cost even further and basically what this ends up giving you is um, you know a very low cost that's based on your particular circumstances it's not based on a arbitrary percentage of discount that we give you it's based on something that you can control that uh, you can understand and that's unique to you and we think that that's a, a great way of um, of reducing costs for customers and we continue to do this as we go on and on and on in our relationship it's not something we do once and forget about um, but looking at selling more together, 
there's really two parts to this um, and it, it all comes down to the the old adage of how do you grow a market well you can either sell new things to existing customers or existing things to new customers and so you know when it comes to selling new functionality so working out how we can help you to gain new functionality in your application we really look to our um, our breadth of services um, <clears throat> we're very proud uh, to have such a, a wide breadth of services, 165 at the last count, with many, many new features being added every year. Um, and we looked at how we can help customers to adopt these technologies so that we can work in partnership to sell them together. And if you can, if you look at this slide, you know, it gives you a bit of an idea of just of the, the wide variety of services that there are and we see many customers at the moment looking at adding uh, iot or particularly analytics offerings to um their current um to their to their current services um and also you know something that's becoming very very uh, interesting to customers recently is the um, machine learning and artificial intelligence and how they can help them to you know add value to their existing application or even provide them with kind of upsell um, opportunities to uh, to their install base um and then the other side of how we help to sell more uh is looking at well how do you sell that technology once you've adopted it once you have that product how do you open new markets with that and to do that we use two key pieces of uh two key technical concepts let's call it and then our partner partner network um the first of the technical concepts is our um, global network of regions. Um, later on, Francisco will talk a bit more, go into a bit more detail about regions and how they work. But just so you know that a region is a, it's a, it's a set of infrastructure that is in a specific geographical location and your data stays in that geographical location. Why is that important? Well, you might be operating in Europe. You'll want all of your data to be stored within the European Economic uh, Area as a as a result, in order to be compliant with various um, data protection rules. Um, and this allows so the the regions within Europe will allow you to do that. But if you want to open new markets by going to Japan or Australia or North America, um, you can you can replicate what you're doing in in Europe in a matter of minutes to the US, to Tokyo, to Sydney, to many different places around the world, knowing that you'll have exactly the same infrastructure presented in the same way and that you'll be able to have the same uh, type of experience that you've had in Europe. Um, but with the key point that you will be in another region, your data will be stored there if that's relevant to compliance rules, and you will have all of the uh, reduced latency that, uh, that, that come with that. And the, the key is that you can do that all around the world in, in exactly the same way and, it, and it's very very uh, quick to do um, the second technical concept is around the aws marketplace this is kind of an online store for software solutions and we think we've got a pretty good pedigree with online stores and so we put a lot of um, focus into this area and i think it's really relevant for companies on this call as it's kind of it can be your place your piece of real estate on the aws website <clears throat> Um, it's a it's a store where customers can go and they use their AWS um, account to purchase software and to start using the infrastructure that um, that they need to drive that. And so the infrastructure will be defined already in the most optimal way to give them the best the best value for the lowest price. Um, it allows them to begin using even from kind of a trial basis right through to a test and development all the way through to scaling to use in full production. <clears throat> excuse me and uh, and the, the really cool thing about this is it allows them also to purchase um, your application through or your service if you like your SaaS service through um, their AWS account um, with AWS taking care of all of the administration around that which means it's very quick and easy for them it allows them to scale and to drive and to, to procure this through a way that they they already have set up and it could be really interesting for many um, startup companies as this allows you to do it in any of the many many geograph geographies around the world where um, AWS marketplace is um, is active and we take those two I've gone very high level through those two I could spend hours talking about each of them but what I want to do is show you how we take those two concepts and then we combine them with our market with our excuse me partner network 
in order to help sell more. Um, this is a very high level overview of the partner network. I'll jump into it in a second, but I want to draw your attention to the link on the bottom right of the screen, um, awfamazon dot com forward slash partners there you can find lots of information about the partner network all set out very easily and logically and also about how you're able to join and move through uh, the various different tiers but i wanted to talk today more about what the value you're getting from it is um you know we kind of split it into these three areas we start by we're talking about building and as well as the technical things we just talked about you know this is about training and certification this is about helping you to uh, build your architecture in a way that you know we don't need to save you money because you'll have built it in the most cost-effective way um, right from the beginning. Um, I'll talk to you, my last slide will be about um, a program we have to help accelerate that kind of architecting and that migrating onto AWS um, to make sure that you could do that in the fastest possible way and get to value in the quickest amount of time. Um, we then take that solution, we look at how we go to market together. There is funding available for marketing development. Um, there are branding opportunities, sponsorship opportunities, speaking opportunities, all the things that you'd expect. What we do try to do, however, is make that really scalable for you and not time consuming. And we have a, an amazing website called APN Marketing Central that allows you to really do uh, most of the things that you would traditionally do in a long-winded um, session with partner marketing managers and what have you, where you need to get lots of approvals and that sort of thing, helps you to do many of those things instantly with the minimum of friction, with the minimum of hassle. And we really, we hear from our partners that that's something that they really like and that really helps them to scale. And then we move into selling together. Now, I talked already about the marketplace and how that helps us to sell together. And I think it's, a, it's an absolute key mechanism for allowing our customers to, to be able to choose from all of our partners different solutions but also as we get into the higher levels the higher um yeah the higher levels of um the partner network well there come opportunities for people to work together with our sales teams to sell to specific customers with you know a joint value proposition so that gives you an idea of, of that kind of selling with you know how do we work together to sell more and then the final thing I wanted to leave you with was talking about something called the Partner Transformation Program for ISVs or PTP for ISVs. Um, this is a, a program that we put together based on feedback from many customers um, who were trying to uh, migrate to AWS. And the idea is that we try using this, we create through a very, very streamlined process, um, a minimum of engagement that you have to make, or more to the point, a minimum of time that you need to invest. And it, it gives you a it gives you a very um, specific uh, way of um, taking advantage of all of the resources that there are within AWS. It already gives you, um, it already gives you uh, funding and technical resources as well to help you. My details are at the bottom. Please feel free to reach out with any other questions or later on in the webinar. Thank you very much. And now I'll pass over to um, Nick from CDSM. CDSM went global with AWS and Nick's gonna tell you how they did that. Hi, thanks Chris. So I'm Nick Goyle from, I'm the head of technology from CDS Interactive. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you about how we went global with AWS and our work to democratize access to education for millions of users. So I'm going to split this up into three parts. I'm just going to give you some context about uh, CDSM and our product thinking. I'll then talk about our journey to scale. And I'm going to wrap up then talking about how AWS was involved in that and how um, and try and give you a few lessons learned that we've uh, learned over the years that could help you and uh, uh, you can take away as, as something that from the uh, from listening to me for 15 minutes. So who is CDSM? We're a small business in based in Swansea in South Wales and in, in the west of uh, the UK. Uh, we were founded by educators in 1998 and uh, we're not a startup. Uh, we've been around for a while but it often feels like it. Um, we're around 50 employees and uh, we're, we're growing pretty rapidly at the moment. So Thinky is our, our flagship product. It's a learning management system. Uh, this is also referred to in, in some industries as a learning platform or a learner experience platform. Uh, we sell into commercial and to public sector and, I, and I'll go over that uh, in a little bit more detail. So we have two national LMS implementations, and that's where we were delivering our software into the entire learning estate of a specific country. Uh, the first one we did is in our home nation of Wales. 
uh, where it's it's called the Hub Platform. Uh, it's used by 1,700 schools in Wales, which is around 600,000 users across the entire state. It sits at the centre of a wide set of services. So if you think of it as a wagon wheel where Hub sits in the middle and allows users to jump out to other services and, uh, involved in the ecosystem. And how it's, it's been running for about five years now, and, and it's evolved into a critical endpoint of delivery of learning into the classroom. And what I mean by that is that use, students and teachers use it on a day-to-day -day basis in the classroom and to be able to do their learning and, and to, to get their work done. So it's absolutely critical for, for them to go about their day-to-day -day business. Based on the success of HUB, our second national LMS rollout was the EKB LMS. So EKB is the Egyptian Knowledge Bank, which is uh, the national LMS for Egypt. This is a part of the EDU 2.0 project, which is a, a wider uh, project, transformation project led by the Minister of Education, Dr. Tarek Shulki, which is overhauling the entire education system, including like infrastructure, hardware, um, and also like software services such as ours. By our count, by our uh, research, it's the largest national LMS implementation in the world uh, with millions of users. And in the last year since it's been live, you know, we feel it's uh, really making an impact on the life chances of, of children and young people in Egypt. We also uh, have a commercial arm of, of our, our platform uh, and we deal with many um, sort of uh, uh, brand names that you'll probably rec recognize. So uh, a few people have flagged audio issues, so I'll, uh, hopefully it'll be clearer. I'll talk a bit slower. So it's scaling up. So this is where we started with AWS, was in 2012 uh, when we moved over. You know, pre-2014, we were relatively small scale public sector and corporate implementations. You know, if you have a corporate of 5,000 people, it's actually quite a low throughput in terms of the amount of usage of the, of the system. Um, we, we're a very traditional stack, uh, .NET, SQL, IES, and during this time we were going to AWS summits in London and we were, we're still seeing the things that, that AWS is talking about around DevOps, microservices, infrastructure as code, and we were, we were starting to make that, that connection that, that cloud computing was something really different. In 2015, uh, Hub was launched, and this is where we began dealing with life at scale. As, as we prepared for the project launch, it became pretty apparent that our, our traditional monolithic architecture that we had built, where, where everything was just one big application, wasn't going to do the job dealing with the scale that we had to deal with. So we went across a, we decided to do a full real rebuild of our LMS as microservices. And this was a concept we'd picked up the previous year from, from the AWS summit. Uh, and we were also using the AWS DevOps tools, things like cloud formation, code build, code deploy, to support our production pipeline. Fast forward two years, and I think it was starting to really take off. Hope it evolved to become the largest Welsh government website. And we'd also launched a multi-tenant commercial offering uh, for our commercial customers. And it was around this time that the Egypt LMS opportunity emerged. And, and what we were really seeing was, was the benefit of the DevOps approach that we had, we had, we had picked up from uh, AWS back in 2014. And you know that, that, that rebuild and that couple of years of um, hard work uh, to try and do the best practice was starting to really pay off for us. In 2018, we launched the EKP LMS. That was in September 2018. But it wasn't all about Egypt in 2018. We know that hope it had evolved and was really was it become that critical environment for delivery of learning in the classroom. And it was absolutely essential to, to the day-to-day -day use um, of um, students and learners, st students and teachers. But what we did realize as well is that like in uh, 2015, when we were launching Hub, we realized that the jump from Wales scale to Egypt scale, which is a significantly bigger country in terms of population, we had uh, we were going to have architectural issues. So again, we went back to the drawing board and we did another rebuild, this time around containers. Uh, I'll talk about this a bit more in, uh, in, future, in another slide further on. Uh, and then we also looked at how we were going to host that on Fargate. So 2019 has been a, has been a pretty exciting year for us. Uh, while the, the numbers here may not you know, compare to things like uh, Netflix or 
Spotify or something like that. You know, in terms of learning interactions, it's an incredibly complex environment. It's something that, um, that Juan Louis and, and Christopher alluded to in their presentations. Um, but what we found was the container work that we'd done, that, that work to rebuild and you start using Fargate and ECS meant that we were getting, you know, greater than four nines uptime, which is which is essential. You know, you think about uh, if students and teachers need to use this in the classroom, that it being available is absolutely critical. And we had this uh, period where there was a, a several hundred thousand tablets uh, distributed to users in Egypt uh, for them to be able to access the system and other systems. And we had a scaling event where we went from 500,000 page views a week to 5 million in a week. And that, that was in the space of one week. And then a couple of weeks later, we had gone to 5 million in a day. So we were going through a period of uh, 10 xing our growth in terms of the, the throughput on our system in every couple of weeks. So while this was uh, incredibly exciting and, and mildly terrifying at the time, we took two things away from it. One was that you know AWS handled the scaling beautifully. You know the services did everything they were supposed to do, and we were able to to, to absorb this like um, incredibly uh, uh, phenomenal growth that we were getting. But the other thing was well was that 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 hard work that we had done uh, behind the scenes around the architecture of our system based on that best practice that we'd been picking up from the AWS summits was, was also uh, borne out and that was able to uh, handle that, that growth. So, so as I said, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit, give you a few lessons learned and hopefully uh, people can take these away and, and, um, and uh, it could help you uh, do it a little bit quicker than we did. So why did we use AWS? Well, at the time when we moved to AWS in 2012, it was the only real option. But the as as the industry evolved and the market evolved, you know, the scalability, cost model, services, geographic coverage, all that sort of thing, it, it, it just fit really well with that business model, and there was no real reason for us to to change that. But there was a couple of things that we did learn uh, over the last couple of years. So one of them was that you know bad product plus great infrastructure still is a bad product. So you know we you can't get away from the fact that you have to do that hard work at the coal face. Uh, you know AWS will support you with the hosting, but you know it's still up to you guys to to be able to to create those meaningful and complex user interactions that, that users are going to love. But uh, some of the unsung heroes of the AWS services are these development tools uh, under the hood, things like code code build, code deploy, and those are absolutely brilliant and and would highly recommend them. So back onto containers. So uh, containers are lightweight standalone virtualized environments, kind of like many, many standalone servers. Uh, but it wasn't what we found is the change between servers and containers wasn't just, uh, oh, I'm going to move from Windows to Linux or, you know, some sort of tech speak thing. It was a paradigm shift across the organization. It challenged our, the way we did things right from how we design our services, how we build our services, how we uh, manage our services and operate our services. And for us, that journey took about 12 months. And it's an ongoing, it's an ongoing process where we've got a long tail. But you know, it was a it was a huge shift. But what we found, as you've seen from what I showed on previous slides, is that 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 journey was borne out when we hit that point of scale. You know, we were ready for it. And um, you know, that that combination of Elastic Container Service with Fargate. And then X-ray for the monitoring has been uh, has been a superb ecosystem for us to work in. So CloudFront, I'm not going to talk too much about CloudFront because uh, Francisco is going to talk about it a little bit more uh, in a bit. But the key thing here is that uh, CloudFront, often people just think of it as a CDN to, to, to provide static assets, but it does a lot more than that, and it's really worth investing time there. Uh, any traffic that you can serve without hitting your backend application servers is basically money you're saving. So in terms of optimizing your application and really getting that, that bang for buck, uh, CloudFront's brilliant. Um, we had a particular day where we had uh, exam results were uh, released in Egypt. We had a huge spike event and 14% um, you know, of that traffic, and that's application logic traffic, didn't even get to our backend servers. Uh, and then there's also uh, supporting services like Guard Duty and Web Application Firewall, security tools, which are, um, which allow you to to make sure you're doing it right, that you're protecting your users and you're you're building that trust. Uh, and um, I'd highly recommend looking into those. So one of the unexpected challenges of 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 going through that massive scaling growth in, in a short period of time was that other systems, uh, other services. So so like. 
you know, we've got our hosting uh, ecosystem, but what about our analytics and our application performance monitoring, things like that? And what we realized, we, we hit issues with uh, uh, the <laughs> licensing, like, you know, like we're running something, suddenly running 25 EC2 instances, we weren't able to meet our licensing. So while this was a challenge, it also was an opportunity to innovate. And we use this as an opportunity to go away and start playing with some of the other services that AWS provide that we hadn't have, hadn't really used before. So uh, the two really cool examples that we had was uh, analytics. We uh, went away, used Kinesis Firehose and Athena to, to replace our analytics solution. And then we went away with uh, and worked for Fargate Document DB CloudWatch to replace our application performance monitoring system. Now, what's cool about that as well is that now we've rolled that out through the whole business, we're saving a considerable amount of money because we don't have to license that product anymore. So uh, leverage AWS. This is my, my advice to, to EdTech, you know, talk to AWS. Uh, I've got a series of things here, you know, things that we've used in the past that are brilliant. But this photo that's on screen, this was from a deep dive immersion day where Kevin Francisco and Dan from the AWS team came down. They worked with us. They sat. They spent all day with uh, five of our engineers doing a bulk and mine meld around reporting and analytics and, and big data. And I think you know, I, I came out of that day thinking that you know we had probably fast forwarded our our uh, our posture around reporting and analytics by by months. You know, so that's just potentially saved us you know a potential amount of thinking time and development time. So the last lesson learned and, and something that I do all the time is, is, is watch where AWS is going. It's not just about the technology, it's not just about the hosting, but it's also about the ideas. Uh, and you know, as I've talked, you've probably gathered from, from, from what we've talked about, is that you know, there's these ideas that we picked up over the, over the years from AWS, like infrastructure as code, DevOps, microservices, containers, that then were in, integral to our success later on. And so we still do this today, and I, I recommend everyone, you know, have an opportunity, go to a summit, look at what's going on and what's getting talked about. You know, for us, we're, you know, big data and machine learning, these services that are emerging are, are super exciting in terms of operating at scale and, and how you can potentially prove our ROI on learning interventions, which is something that's been traditionally very difficult to do. So... Thank you all very much for, for uh, listening. Uh, you can find out more here and you know if you've got any questions, fire them over. And now I would like to hand over to Francisco, who's a solution architect at AWS, and he's going to be talking to you about the global infrastructure available. All right, thank you, Nick. So hi, everyone. My name is Francisco Gonzalez. I'm a solutions architect here in AWS. And today we're going to talk about um, AWS global infrastructure and at the end, I'm going to give you a very high level overview of some of our AI ML services. So um, AWS uh, global infrastructure. So we, we, we work in the concept of, um, of a region. Um, so a region is basically a separate geographical area where um, essentially you get to uh, run your workloads. Um, I think we talked about it earlier, but one of the most important things that we have in Amazon when it comes to regions is that Whatever you do in a specific region or whatever you, whatever data you put in a specific region, it will never leave that region unless you want it to. Um, another important concept of regions is that um, inside each region, uh, we have the concept of an availability zone. And each availability zone has its own, um, it, it's basically an isolated uh, zone, which essentially has its own, um, you know, its own power, its own cooling, um, and even they're, you know, placed in, in separate uh, ground planes. Um, as of now, as of today, we currently have 22 geographical regions and 69 availability zones. And right now, we are uh, we have previously announced uh, three different uh, new regions um, upcoming. Now, this wasn't like this from the beginning, and I'll just like to spend a few minutes on on how did we get to. Uh, 22 regions and 69 availability zones. So we initially started uh, with four regions in the in the first five in the first five years, uh, namely North California, North Virginia, Ireland, Singapore. Uh, at the time, we still had more uh, than other cloud providers, but um, because we know a lot of customers need their workload as close, uh, very close to their users, then um, we we started basically adding more regions across the globe. And in the next five years, 
we increased the number uh, by seven, making it uh, 11 in the first uh, 10 years. Uh, but as of now, uh, between 2016 and 2019, we, we already matched that number. So, and, and we have, you know, as I said earlier, uh, three, three more uh, we have, which we have officially announced, uh, namely uh, Milan in Italy, Cape Town, and uh, Jakarta. Now, you know, as a summary, you know, 22 geographical regions and 69 availability zones. And, and I think this is important for edtechs because I think, uh, you know, workloads may not be necessarily limited to a specific audience uh, in a specific region. And you sometimes want that same infrastructure to be present in other places around the globe. And AWS really allows you to go global uh, in minutes using this, this infrastructure. Now, just a, a little bit of a deep dive on, on what's under the hood. So as I said earlier, um, each region will have multiple availability zones, but each avail availability zone may have uh, one or more data centers. And I think this is very different from, from other cloud vendors because our concept of a region includes uh, availability zones, which includes multiple data centers. Uh, and, and, and I think that's, that's important to, to understand. Uh, in order to design your applications so that they can scale and be uh, fault tolerant. Now, we, we have a very interesting product called uh, CloudFront, which kind of uh, expands beyond what we have uh, within the, the, the region concept. And uh, um, yes, it is our CDN product, but there's more that you can do uh, as opposed to just share, uh, you know, uh, serving static content because we have uh, products like Lambda at Edge that allows you to run code at the edge. And I think this, this leveraging of these two products, it's essential when it comes to caching uh, your workloads at the edge, uh, allowing you to scale faster and, and save a lot of money as well. And this is just a view of the uh, number of uh, uh, physical points of presence. Uh, we recently announced uh, three, uh, literally about uh, I think it was like three days ago. So right now we um, we hit the 200 uh, number in terms of uh, points of presence, out of which 189 are edge locations, and this spreads across 70, 70, uh, 77 cities as as well as uh, 35, uh, 34 countries. Sorry. Now, uh, let's talk just a minute about sustainability. So I think it's worth mentioning that AWS's long-term commitment is to be uh, to achieve 100% renewable energy usage for our global infrastructure footprint. As of January uh, last year, we actually achieved 50%, uh, the 50% mark, and, but we are not done. We, we obviously want to get to 100%. And uh, in April 2019, we, we announced, uh, so at that time, sorry, we, we essentially have uh, six solar farms and three wind farms and we uh, announce three of them. So, so, so we want to make sure that it's not only global, but it's also sustainable. Now, uh, let me just switch gears a little bit um, because I know, you know, definitely infrastructure is good, uh, but we know that you can grow a lot faster if you understand our machine learning stack. So I'm just going to spend two minutes to give you a high level overview of, of you know, what is, what is this and, and, and how can you use it. So what you need to know is that we got three layers. Uh, the, the top layer are the ready to use services, AI ML services that you can use with no AI ML experience. Uh, the middle layer is a specific product called Amazon SageMaker. And the bottom layer is the infrastructure, right? So let me speak a little bit about the services. So we have vision services, which allows you to, you know, with no machine learning experience to basically take an image and understand what's in it. So let's say I have a picture and, and there's a landscape. So the, the uh, Amazon recognition will tell me that there's a landscape and probably a tree on it. Or you know, what if I have documents that I need to process uh, and I wanna capture the text in them. So you can use Textract uh, as an API uh, to be able to do this with, with, a, with, no, with no servers to provision or any, any other background. All you have to do is specify the JPEG and you get a JSON object back. Or take uh, Duolingo, for example, where they used uh, Amazon Polly to uh, revolutionize the way they create their content because now they don't need human beings to record any kind of uh, interaction that's required for you to learn a new language and they can use Polly for that. Um, we also have Transcribe, 
which essentially does the opposite of poly. Poly will basically, you know, tr convert text to speech, but we also have, uh, you know, a transcription service where you, which you can use to maybe uh, bring subtitles to your videos in a, in a very cost efficient manner. Uh, we also have language services, which allows you to translate from one language to another. But very interestingly, we also have Amazon Comprehend, which allows you to understand what's in the text. Uh, and this could be things like classification or detecting sentiment and things like that. Um, we also have chatbot services, which allows you to create chatbots without too much effort. Forecasting, uh, which is basically a, an easy way to uh, run forecasting models without actually running uh, a server and we have recommendations engines such as uh, personalize um, i'm actually running out of time but what i do want to mention is that if, if these services which are ready to use do not fit your use case we also have a very very extremely interesting service called amazon SageMaker, which allows you to create your own models and we have a very nice service uh, a very nice uh, section of our, our service within SageMaker, which is basically the the notebooks which allows you to run uh, your code uh, interactively, uh, you know, within to be able to create your models. Um, we also have infrastructure elements which allows you to do machine learning, and these includes, um, you know, servers with GPUs, um, FPGAs. Uh, we we have a vast, uh, you know, kind of a selection of ways you can run containers. Um, Fargate being one of them, as well as um, EKS or Kubernetes, uh, and we also have other services uh, like Inferentia, which allows you to infer uh, in the cloud in a, in a very cost-efficient manner. And that's all I had for today. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Over to you, Xenia. Thank you, Francisco. Um, and thank you all today for uh, joining the webinar, but also thank you, uh, the presenters, for taking your time and sharing uh, the programs that we have in place today, but also Francisco walking us through the global infrastructure. And additionally, um, I think it's always nice to hear from a customer. So uh, CDSM, Nick, thank you so much for sharing your story with us today. Um, what we really tried to do with this webinar today is try to show to you the programs we have in place and that we are here truly to support you on your edtech journey. Um, so we've been getting quite a few questions um, around the EdStar program. Um, Juan, do you mind just explain to us how easy is it to get started and sign up uh, with EdStar? Yes, uh, thank you, Sonia. So it is actually uh, quite easy. Um, uh, first, first, just as soon as you go and visit uh, our uh, website, simple, simply just Google AWS Ed Start or just put um, AWS.Amazon.com slash Ed Start, AWS Ed Start, sorry. You will get um, all sorts of information around the program, uh, specific information around the criteria that we use to select um, applications, and, and also you will see kind of two um, two different uh, boxes which where you can click and apply to the program remember there are two different tiers one is the innovators tier looking at uh, early stage uh, edtech startups and then we have the member tier that is looking at those uh, edtech startups that are already uh, running their business they have a, a product in place they have a few customers or so a lot of customers uh, but would also like to get support from from us not just from the technical side but also from business side introduction to customers investors and so forth so uh, just simply visit AWS at start. Thank you, Juan. Um, Chris, also we had some questions around the APN program, Amazon Partner Network program. Um, what are the the basic, the generic requirements to get started on the APN? Hi there. So um, if you go to the link on uh, on the slide that I showed earlier on, so aws.amazon.com forward slash partners, I think that's the best place to find uh, out that information. Uh, you can become a partner in the next 10 minutes, um, a, a registered partner, and start already taking advantage of some of those um, 
uh, advantages, advantages and benefits, and um, and then you know you rise through different tiers of partnership. The next one after um, the initial registered level is um, select, and uh, to get to select, you need um, some technical expertise, some technical certifications in your team, and you need uh, some also some. Um, uh, what's the word? Some commercial um, specialists. It's all noted down there. It's fairly um, straightforward uh, and is usually very much in line with the business that people are trying to do when they're running applications on AWS. So I'd encourage you to go and have a look at our website and reach out to me, and I can put you in touch with a member of my team who can uh, who can help you uh, dive even deeper. Thank you so much for that, Christopher. That's great. Um, and Nick, we, we did get quite a lot of questions around the reason why you chose AWS. But I guess just to summarize for everyone, what was your main reason for choosing AWS? Thanks, Ksenia. So uh, at the time when we, we first moved over to AWS back in 2012, uh, I think AWS was the only uh, real serious cloud provider. But after that point, once we started using it more and more, even though other um, very good providers started appearing on the market, um, we found that you know the geographic spread of services, you know, CloudFront locations, uh, the sort of stuff that uh, that Francisco was talking about, as well as the services and and the pay-as-you-go cost model, you know, that 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 drive to optimize your costs, it, it just made sense for us to, to to continue with AWS, and and that's where we've kind of uh, put our energy. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for that, Nick. Um, thank you everyone for joining the webinar today. Uh, just to let you all know, we will send a follow-up questionnaire. Uh, some of the questions that we will have there is what would you would like to see next or what would you like us to improve on? We are customer obsessed, so it's really important for us uh, to get your feedback because essentially what you would like to see next is what would we be working on um, we will be following up with you so if there's any questions that weren't answered today uh, we will answer them with the follow-ups again thank you all for joining today it, it was a pleasure thank you <laughs>